Okay, we are live. We had a bit of technical difficulties. I'm going to go ahead and throw my MacBook under the proverbial bus here. It was about a half hour before game time. Computer was running a little slow. Figured we'd turn it off back on. Just, you know, let it get a little bit comfortable. And I uh, decided to go through the whole update process. So I apologize. We are now 15 minutes behind schedule. Chris, thanks for your patience. Absolutely. I'm excited. We're going to, there'll be a couple people showing up. It says nobody's watching yet. So we're talking to an empty room, which is beautiful, but at least I have you and you have me. So here we go. Right. But uh, this will be recorded. We are doing a three part series. It is February 4, 2021. We have survived 2020 and can't wait to see what 2021 has to throw at us. Um, but I've got a very special guest here. One of the, the common series of questions or categories of questions that we get in the Facebook groups and the book flipping community is often related to taxes. And the common answer that we just kind of throw out is, well, talk to a CPA, talk to a tax expert, talk to you know somebody that's, that's qualified or certified. And uh, we, you know, unfortunately, we can't give you a lot of great advice. So instead of me trying to give you advice and being liable if I give you bad advice, I figured I'd bring on uh, actually a good friend of mine, but also my accountant and my tax professional. You have a you have a certain. You, you told me this this afternoon. I keep forgetting. You have yeah. a certain qualification. What tell us tell us who you are and what your qualifications are, and we're going to jump into this fun conversation. So I am an enrolled agent with the IRS, which means my specialty is very much in tax. Um, we have a group of, uh, of CPAs and, uh, and bookkeepers that, uh, that do a lot of really, really good work for our businesses and, uh, and the bookkeeping side of things. But my job is to find ways to save you money in taxes and, uh, and implement the strategy necessary to do so. Perfect. So, Chris, you're based where? Uh, I'm in Annapolis. Um, we actually have uh, two offices in Maryland, but uh, clients across the country. So the nice thing about having a license with the IRS is uh, there's not a, a state level restriction associated with any of our operations. Perfect. So you can go anywhere in the US. Yep. Go anywhere, do anything. Perfect. A modern, a modern man of mystery. <laughs> well, Chris and I have, uh, We've met several times over the last couple of years. He has dealt with the frustrations of trying to keep a tight rein on uh, on my accounting. I under <laughs> I understand what to do, but I'm not the best at following through and setting up systems and the discipline involved. So we're going to have fun tonight. This is going to be a three part series and maybe we'll extend it into a little bit more. I know we're getting into Chris's busy season right now. Um, you know, corporate taxes due mid March. And then, of course, all the regular taxes are due mid April. And so I appreciate you sparing some of your precious time. We're going to try and keep this to roughly an hour and we're going to talk a bit. I've got a bit of an agenda for each of the three uh, sessions here and those dates. I should have pulled them up. It's today, February 4. The next one will be February 9, I believe, and then February 15. So mm -hmm. all of those at seven o'clock Eastern. We've got Diane in the house, Coco Garcia, Junkman assuming that's not your real name, but I know you're on a lot of our streams. So thanks for being here. So let's jump right in. The The goal is a, we're doing a three part series. This is we're calling this accounting 101 and uh, accounting can take a lot of different directions. But the main goal we want to do is Chris has kind of prepared the, the, the basic questions that come up as it relates to accounting. And he's going to help us just kind of remove some of the cloudiness and the uncertainty. So many of you, whether you're just starting out or even if you've been you know, selling online for a while, I guess the questions are, well, wh what about taxes? And I think most of us get through our first year and then tax time comes and Amazon either gives us a 1099 or a K1 um, and we get that and go, uh, oops, now what? And then we you know, figure it out. We call a CPA. We're in a panic. And usually we owe more money than we have. And uh, our goal here is to help make sure that doesn't happen. So session sure. one, we're going to get into some of the basics of accounting, why it's important, how to set up those systems. We're just going to stay somewhat basic. Part two is going to be the fun one. We're going to get into deductions. So, you know, the accounting equation is what you make minus what you spend. Qualified expenses equals what your taxable income is. And then you can figure out what you owe from there. So we'll get into some of the fun deductions as it relates to travel, as it relates to inventory, supplies, home office deduction all those kind of fun stuff. So that, that'll that be one you definitely don't wanna miss. And then part three, we're gonna get into some of the more complex pieces, like should I have an S-corp? 
Uh, what about employees versus independent contractors? What are the what are the rules there? And we might even talk about sales tax. So we're we'll 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 jump into some of the landmines on the third session. So Chris, why don't you jump in? Let's talk through basically what about taxes? So so most people have a W two income. They work on salary or an hourly wage at the end of the year or, or all the way throughout the year. They get a, a pay stub. Their company's withholding tax for them, and at the end of the year, they typically get a refund, which you know, we've been conditioned to believe is awesome from watching these, these commercials on TV. The reality is the government got an interest-free loan from all of us and then yeah. we get we get our money rightfully back. The downside of running your own business, I don't think I've had a refund in four or five years. It's usually, you know, <laughs> I have to write a check uh, and sometimes they want interest. So I don't understand how that works. Yeah. But talk talk to us a bit, uh, just once we start jumping in and uh, and having a business, why are we paying taxes? How does that work? And, and let's jump into some of that background. Yeah, let's start with um, how you pay taxes as an employee, right? And you, you you hit the nail on the head, right? You're you're used to getting a paycheck if it's once a month or every two weeks, twice a month, something like that. Your employer provides that money, um, and they withhold the tax for you. So you get paid five thousand a month. Uh, you see three thousand of that. I know it feels like less all the time. Um, but that delta, right, the difference between that 5000 and that, that 3000 goes to your side of payroll tax and then federal and state tax, right? So payroll tax consists of Social Security and Medicare. Um, you pay half and then the employer pays half. Um, and, uh, and then you have your federal tax withholdings. And then if you live in a state where there is an income tax, um, you have your state level tax withholdings as well. And so that's where your money goes. And that's really nice. A lot of us are accustomed to that simply because that's, that's all we've ever known. And then the employer does all the work for you. When you jump off the, uh, the diving board into the deep end of self-employment, now you have this, you're wearing two hats, right? And, uh, and so now you are the employer and the employee. You have to keep in mind that, that both sides of that payroll tax have to be paid. Uh, in addition to your federal tax and state tax, if it's applicable. Um, and Caleb, as you mentioned, right, the, the money you're paying tax on isn't everything you make, right? And so Amazon is, is brutal with their fees. You can, you can go out and crush it making $300,000 in a year. You may see 60 of that when all is said and done. And, uh, and so it's total income minus all of the expenses, including fees, that delta right there, that's what you're subject to income tax and then the payroll taxes. Uh, as Perfect. Well. So uh, let's break this down. I'm, I'm gonna be, this is my sketchy sketch board and uh, I'm gonna try and be a, be a professor. This will be our virtual whiteboard. So let's let's walk through exactly what that is. So this is gonna be specifically geared toward uh, booksellers, although this applies to really any small business, right? The principles are the same. And of course, yeah. if you sell on Amazon, the principles are the same. We should have called this uh, bookkeeping for booksellers or books for books or something like that. But yeah, uh, yeah I wasn't that great <laughs> at, at the time. Okay. So let's, let's, when you're an employee, right, you get the W2. Now that you're the boss, even if you don't have a team, even if it's just you, even if whatever, we'll get into business structure in just a second. Yeah. Um, let's look at that equation. So we have sales, which we all, we like, that's what everybody brags about, right? I've got these sales and let's just use numbers, right? So let's say we have $300,000 of sales in a year. Now do, am I stuck paying taxes on my gross sales, my top line? No, it would crush all of us if we were. Yeah, um, exactly. So, all right. So, yeah, so you have to factor in deductions, right? So what do you spend money on throughout the year, Caleb? Well, so sales, we're also going to have, so Amazon's going to take their fees, right? Yep. So we'll just say Amazon fees, We've got all of our, you know, shipping costs, storage fees, et cetera, but all of that kind of rolls up under Amazon. And so then we have what Amazon pays us, right? So this is the money yeah. that goes into our account. So this is the money that gets deposited. And typically if you're selling $20 books, you're going to get 45 to 50% of this back. Let's just say you get 125 K cause you had a lot of shipping costs, right? Yeah. So I guess, do I pay tax on this? So I took my Amazon fees out. Here's the money that goes in my bank. So at the end of the year, ignoring all my expenses, which we'll cover in a second, I have $125,000 of bank deposits. Is that my taxable number? Now you've got to factor in the rest of those expenses and what you're using to actually run your business throughout the year. Right? Perfect. Yep. 
So let's let's dive into some of those. So you you asked me what are those for me? Well, I have uh, cost of inventory. I have That's supplies, you bought, right? Yep. I have supplies. I have you know boxes, tape, labels. I've got uh, warehouse rent, labor. So lease, labor. Uh, insurance. I mean, pretty much anything that's related to the business, right? We get to deduct that. Yeah. Okay. Technology, and Scout IQ, uh, all the software. You guys are, uh, you've got software coming out your ears. Yeah, exactly. Kind of makes us more efficient. Yeah. All right. So let's say all of the expenses total up to, let's just call it 65. Yep. And that leaves us with 60. So is this my taxable income? Yes. Ballpark. So, yep. So that's, that's a good ballpark number. So that's the number that if you're setting money aside, right? So everybody's always asking, how much do I set aside for, for taxes or how much is my tax bill going to be? My answer is, I don't know. I mean, it depends on when we're talking throughout the year. So, so if, if 60 grand is that number, right? That net income at the end of the day, then a rough ballpark to set aside is about a third, unfortunately. Um, so a third of that goes to taxes. Goes to the tax man. All right, um, can you help break that down? So I know there's different brackets and one of the misunderstandings, it's kind of fun to clear this one up. I've actually had tax people tell me this, not you, you're smarter than this, fortunately. I've actually had tax people say, you should, you know, or they, they advise people, you should just stop making money at a certain point because you're just gonna end up paying a higher bracket tax on everything, right? So there's different tax brackets, 15%, 20%, 22, whatever. And yeah. I've had people say, well, if you're right below the edge of a bracket, you shouldn't go above it because you're going to then end up paying a higher percentage on everything. Yeah. And that's, so that's a little bit of a misunderstanding of our tax brackets. So let's talk about those for just a second. Um, right. The first dollar that you make January 1st of any year is taxed at 0% at the federal level. Um, and so you can make up to 10 grand, we'll say. And then you start jumping into a taxable bracket. Wait, wait, wait. So if, I, if I want to avoid paying taxes, I just have to make less than 10 grand. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> That's it. So okay. just pay your okay. mortgage, pay everything else, and, and we're done. Well, no, I'll just uh, use paper money for that. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, All right. So that next tax bracket, right? And this is what you hear. What tax bracket are you in? Exactly. Usually what, what people are asking is, about that last dollar. So the last dollar that you make December 31st, well, let's say that dollar is taxed at 23%. But remember, we have a graduated tax system. So ultimately, your average tax rate across the whole year, right? You've got 0% tax on that first dollar, 23% tax on that last dollar. You're probably falling somewhere in that 14, 15% range as far as an effective tax rate at the federal level. Yep. And there's, do you have any great calculators offhand or websites you go to? Um, like bankrate.com is, is great for like mortgages. So is there a way to just figure out, let's say I think I'm going to make 75 grand in my business in 2021. Is there yeah. a way to figure out what that effective or average tax rate is going to be? Yeah, you can actually, the IRS has a couple of those different calculators. I'll, uh, I'll send those and maybe we can post them. Um, okay. But uh, so those yeah. in the link uh, in some of the, in the comments below after this video okay. goes live guys. All right, so, yeah, so let's, let's, let's pretend, let's yep, so let's talk, so federal bra uh, tax brackets on 60K, um, mm -hmm. that's going to be, what's my average effective federal rate likely gonna be? 12, 10%. So let's say, all right, so we have federal taxes. So on 60K, let's say it's gonna be like 12%-ish. Sure. Okay, what other taxes do we have? We've got payroll tax, we've got state income tax. Yep. And, and really, really pay attention. This is what crushes people, right? It, it's, it's called self-employment tax at, uh, during this conversation, but it's both sides of payroll tax. Now, and what if I don't pay myself right. payroll? Do I still, am I still responsible? Unfortunately, yes. Um, and, and so when you run your business through your personal tax return, which is the vast majority of you guys, um, so it's get, it gets reported on a schedule C. Um, and, uh, and that would be your sole proprietors, your disregarded entities, your LLCs. Um, they, uh, they get reported on your personal tax return. That's the vast majority of you. Um, and ultimately the net profit that stems from that business 
is subject to self-employment tax, both sides of payroll tax. And, uh, and this is what hurts, right? This is, this is 15%. And, uh, and it, it's not something that you're accustomed to setting aside when you come from that W-2 income, right? That, that traditional employment and you're moving into kind of the self-employment world. Exactly. So that exact number is 15.3%, correct? Correct. So it's 7.65% right. is the employer portion of payroll and it's 765 is the employee portion. And we'll get into this in, in part three, as we get into the, uh, the sole, you know, independent contractor versus uh, a W-2 or a regular employee. But this is really important guys. And this is something that if you're not paying attention, you're like, well, I got my federal tax bracket figured out. I know roughly what I'm going to pay. State income tax. Some of you are fortunate. There's no state income tax in what is it? Florida, Texas, Nevada, Tennessee. Yeah, New Hampshire, Washington. You know, some of those cool states. If you're living there, lucky you. I think that's why Elon Musk moved to uh, Texas. <laughs> One of the reasons I think he was done with California. But yeah. state income tax, you can you can Google that. That's also going to be a bracketed type system too, right? Uh, in some states, it's bracketed. In in others, it's just a fixed rate. Um, so every dollar is three and a half percent, for example. Yeah, it's typically like three to five percent, right? Yeah. Yeah. So again, most of you are kind of thinking this way, you know, federal and state, and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm playing roughly 15 to 16 percent, and we forget about this guy. So this is this is yep. really important. Now, let's talk a little bit of timing. So if this was the case, I would actually be paying roughly 31.3 percent, which goes back to your third uh, comment from yep. earlier. So, yeah, I, I took 60K. I actually put 60K in the bank after all the expenses, labor, employees, warehouse, supplies, everything. And now I've got to pay roughly 20 grand in taxes. So let's yeah. talk about timing on that. And then I want to talk about how to set this system up so that it's easier to track because otherwise it's a nightmare come tax time. Agreed. So timing with this, um, we you have in, in self-employment world, you have this new concept called estimated taxes. Um, okay. So you, you make money throughout the year. The IRS wants their cut. It's not an issue when you're a W-2 employee because you're paying taxes every time you get paid. And, uh, and so the IRS gets their pay throughout the year nice and evenly and, and they're happy. Yep. Well, with self-employment income, it all comes to you. And so the IRS sees that you made money throughout the year. You file your tax return and it's, ah, all right, I've got 20 grand to pay. You're going to get penalties and interest on top of this because you didn't give it to the IRS in even installments throughout the year. So that's where you hear that term quarterly estimated tax payments. Come in. Now, are these are these penalties like credit card, you know, interest rates or are they, are they a little bit more reasonable? No, they're reasonable, right? It's a uh, it's it's depending on the quarter. It's about three to six percent um, uh, is the interest rate on the money that you owe to the IRS. Uh, the penalty can be 10% or more, depending on what we're talking about with the, with the IRS. Now, so bottom line, pretty important to actually pay attention and do this properly because that's a, that's a big hit if you're not paying attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So how do I, I figure that out quarterly. How do I actually pay it to the government and tell them it's from me, right? Yeah. So irs.gov slash pay is a good website where you can log in. It's all secure. You can make just an electronic payment like we pay everything these days. And, uh, and you just, you earmark it as an estimated tax payment. The IRS will take your money any way they can get it. Um, and so you just need to tell them how to apply it. And so you want to make sure that you're applying it to a current year, if that's your intention, rather than if you owe back taxes and everything else, you're, you're paying for prior year taxes. Yep. And if I'm not fancy and don't have an LLC, can I just match it up to a social security number? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So if I have an LLC, I'll have an EIN typically, and you can match it up to that. So tell them which business entity is essentially doing the prepayment. Yeah. And ultimately uh, with, with either a disregarded entity or anything that's reported on your individual tax return, it's all pushing back to your social security number anyway. Um, and so these are personal estimated tax payments. And, uh, and so the vast majority of the time you're tying this to, to a social security number. Cool. Now, what if I mess up and uh, let's say Amazon tanks or I get suspended halfway through the year and I end up overpaying? It, am I stuck? Did I just overpay and I can't get it back? What, what's the penalty or what's the, what happens if I overpay? Yeah. And so this is why we don't overcommit, um, right? Because you could have just a gangbusters first quarter, right? It's textbook season and, and your January, February is awesome. Um, 
and then you go really, really dry and then your account gets suspended. And so you were planning on making all this money and, uh, and then all sources of income drop, but you've still got expenses. You've still got to pay rent and, and you're, you're paying people. And so that what we had projected as net profit um, is now dramatically reduced and your tax liability is, is far less. Um, the IRS is really, really bad at giving money back to you. <laughs> and, uh, and so there are, there are instances where if you overpay, sometimes you can request that, that repayment um, before the end of the year. But a lot of times you just have to wait until we file tax returns and you get that refund back. So don't overcommit to this. Um, you do small chunks and, uh, and you make it a really, really deliberate uh, estimated payment. Yeah. So bottom line is you can get your money back, but just like any government system, they're quick to take your money, slow to give it back. So you will yep. get it back. It'll come back in the form of, of a refund. What if yep. I don't, and, and I don't want to get too much into it. A, a good tax advisor, a good CPA will actually sit down with you, look at what your business is doing. Chris and I, we actually usually have monthly calls, but typically quarterly calls and just kind of check in and say, Hey, are we higher or lower or right at schedule? And we just make tweaks. It's yeah. just like flying a plane, right? We're not, you know, as the plane's coming in for a landing, we're make, making adjustments. Um, I don't even know all the plane terms, but popping up ailerons and yeah. runners. And <laughs> back. That, that's all my li lingo I got. Yeah. Bernoulli's principle. We're using Bernoulli's principle, uh, but I, I digress. So we're going to make adjustments throughout the year, bottom line, and, and make sure that we're coming in really close to where we want to be. In, in a perfect world, you actually don't, owe anything at the end of the year and you don't get any refund. You've, you've kind of yeah. dialed it in, but there's there's margin of error in both ways and it's totally acceptable. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, a good tax person will help you understand. Um, what about a couple other questions that come up? So I believe Amazon won't, is it a 1099 or a K1 that they give us? They'll give you a 1099, uh, it's a 1099K. K. And, and so it is a, it, it's a reporting of all of the electronic transactions that they've provided to you. Now, they only provide that if I hit a certain threshold. I think it's 20 grand in a year. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the number this year. All right. So if I if I made 19 grand or sold top line 19K, am I responsible for paying taxes still? Yes. Um, so the IRS is very, very clear on that. And uh, and you're responsible for every dollar you make in the year, whether it's reported to them or not. Um, and uh, and so that is that's an important thing to keep in mind. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the IRS. Uh, they are a vengeful group and, uh, and they're one of the few people that can actually just reach into your bank account and take stuff. And they know uh, how to find you. Yeah. They're really good. You think the government, I mean, you know, all the tech companies know exactly where we are with our phones, but the IRS can find you. And, and yeah, they'll come knocking on your door. <laughs> so. Well, in fact, I mean, a lot of the, the criminals in like the twenties and whatnot, they got taken down, not for, uh, you know, prohibition type stuff, they got taken down for tax evasion. So yep. be careful. The IRS holds a, a mighty sword. Yeah. Um, what if I, um, so that's if I, well, what about if I don't make money? Let's say I lose money. And so I'm not going to have to pay tax, right? You don't have to pay tax right. if you have a loss. Should I still yeah. bother with filing and filling everything out? Um, so yes, because some of the, some of the time you can carry that loss forward. And, uh, and so that's important especially uh, a lot of you guys, this is a side job or a hobby. And, and so first couple of years, as you're starting this business out, a loss is perfectly normal, right? It's to be expected. And, uh, and, and often that loss will offset taxable income coming in from other sources. So you have your normal nine to five. Um, and let's say we lost 10 grand this year um, with the business because it's just startup costs, right? So you make $75,000 with your normal job. Um, and let's say that's your taxable income. Well, the $10,000 loss is going to reduce your taxable income dollar for dollar. And so ultimately that lowers your tax liability pretty dramatically. Yep. And, and losses you get to carry forward indefinitely. They stay with you. Um, and you can always apply those to future gains if you don't do anything else. So yeah, that's, there's, that's a pretty good way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we'll get into deductions and, and inventory. I know Coco's got a question about, you know, what if you reinvested all the money you made into new inventory? That's kind of the old question. December 31st, I've got $12,000 yeah. of tax. Um, can I just buy $12,000 of inventory and not pay tax this year? So officially, no. Um, the, the ultimate deduction from purchasing inventory actually occurs when it's sold. And, uh, and so that's the costs of goods sold not costs of goods purchased. And, yep. uh, and, and so 
you can buy the inventory, but it's not deductible until it's sold. And uh, and so that's why that approach doesn't work. Usually. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover that in a little more detail in part two, as well as the old question of, hey, I bought a Gaylord of books. How do I account for this? We will answer that in part two, as well as, hey, I've got 600 duds and I'm going to donate them. Uh, can I just claim a huge deduction because the, you know it's 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 a it's a it's a good that I'm giving away. We'll cover yeah. that in part two. That'll be that's that's a fun one. Yeah. All right. Now that we've scared everybody into well, I have to pay a third probably of my ta of my income back to the government at some point. So that's no fun. And I've got to I've got to do all these filings quarterly. Let's talk to people. All right. So they're like, hey, I, I've been selling for a bit. Maybe I've got 10, 20, 30 k of sales, or maybe I'm just kicking the tires and getting started. Should I like? panic and worry and set up an LLC and get separate bank accounts and do everything? Or what? what's like the very basic few things that I should do just to make everything easier for the rest of the year? Sure. So a lot of this depends on what you want out of your business or hobby, however you define it. And and so keeping it simple, right? Bare bones, what do I need? It, you, you need to track the ins and the outs. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, right, Caleb, you've got your spreadsheet, which is phenomenal. And if people kind of just treat that as religion, that's all I need to prepare a tax return. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, the problems come into play when people aren't diligent about tracking those ins and outs. Um, and so then you get personal expenses mixed in with business expenses and you lose out on deductions that way. You always, you always lose. Um, and, uh, and so it doesn't really matter how you go about doing it, as long as that ultimate goal of tracking the ins and the outs is achieved. Now, there are ways to make that a lot easier. Um, uh, spreadsheets are good. Separate bank accounts are awesome. Um, if, if you can be diligent in just using the, the bank account card for business expenses, then you can track it. And it's really easy to, to keep track of all the ins and the outs. The way I recommend everybody start is just, it doesn't have to be a business account with your bank and a special name and everything else. Just open up another checking account and mentally allocate that as your business account. Put some money in it and then all of the business expenses come out of that account. Exactly. All right. So I put some money in it to start. Can I just take that back out at some point? Yeah, at some point. Absolutely. It's your money. Yeah. Real quick, guys, there's a there's a, a link or just a, a, a URL down below. If you want the tracking spreadsheet, uh, I've got several videos. You can just YouTube tracking spreadsheet, the book flipper, um, and you'll see way too much information. But it's the bookflipper.com slash track. This is really a full accounting system for Amazon sellers. So it tracks everything that you're selling. It tracks your cost of goods sold. You get lots of other metrics like your sources. Um, and so it's just a, it's a one time fee. And it's going to help you get a really good picture on your business, which helps you run a more efficient and effective business. But it also makes tax time easily. It, it, it generates all the financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Um, and uh, I just give that to Chris at the end of each year. It's got a spot you can plug your mileage in, your extra supplies, other income if you sell on eBay. And really, that's kind of the ecosystem that I do for all of my Amazon selling. And I just kind of update that throughout the year, kick it to Chris, and it makes that portion of taxes significantly easier. So check Definitely. that out. Um, I think it's bonus 50, B-O-N-U-S five zero will save you 50 bucks. So if you're watching this, there's a little Easter egg for you. All right, so I've got my bank account. You said it, it doesn't have to be a business account. So if I'm not sure this is going to take off and I don't wanna, I know some states it's five or 600 bucks to register for an LLC right. uh, and I don't wanna invest that money. You're saying I don't have to right away. No, I mean, kick the tires for a little bit. Treat it, treat it as a hobby, do, do whatever you need to do. I mean, it's really easy. You can go online and you can open up another bank account just like that, right? And uh, and so it's a little bit more complex if you're trying to open a business account, but it all flows the same. So open up another checking account, mentally allocate that as your business and, yep. and treat it accordingly. Perfect. What are some uh, good banks that you recommend that are pretty easy to work with online? Well, you guys are seeing the consequence of kind of those those digital banks a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can we have can we have a moment of silence? <laughs> so Aslo was a, a BBV, BBVA. It was a it was Compass, and uh, it's a Mexican bank. They had one of the best online interfaces I've seen for 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 business banks. It was unbelievable. 
And I convinced my whole team, I convinced Romer the Romer, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, we set up Scout IQ through there, eFlip. All my businesses ran through Aslo, and then they announced that they got bought out. And rather than keep Aslo, which would have made sense, they were investing, it was a really good tool, they decided to kill it. So I don't know what they're doing instead, but we have until the end of March to get every dollar out of there, otherwise it will be gone forever. Yeah. So yeah, now I have to go through that whole process. But all right, so Aslo is a bad idea. If any of the Aslo employees are watching, it's not the employee's fault. You all were wonderful. You built a great product. But whoever made the decision to ax it, come on. Come on. All right, so Aslo, bad idea. Uh, yeah. I really like Ally. What, what do you like? Yeah, Ally's good. Really, any big bank that you know is going to be there, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and so the big chains, even just kind of the smaller regionals, um, Wells Fargo, I, it, it just – Ultimately, you're never going to find that personal relationship like we used to have in, in the 90s and the early 2000s where you could go into the bank and, and really talk with somebody. These All of this is transactional now. So find yeah, something they, that works for you. They try and chase you out, which yeah. is interesting. So I, I like local banks. We've got um, I used First Bank out in Colorado, plus they're orange, which you all know I'm a sucker for orange. And I used uh, Lake City Bank locally, and I'm with Old National, but it's just local banks are nice. It's nice to go in and, and say, hey, pre-COVID times and at least have a relationship there. Yeah. Um, Ally is really nice. They have a bucketing system. I'll actually do some videos on on kind of setting up some of the, the financial tech side of things because I'm a nerd when it comes to that. But get a separate bank account. And then what are our ins from there? It's going to be Amazon sales, so, right? You can connect your Amazon, your Amazon account to this bank account. So yeah. they're going to deposit money in. If you sell on eBay or Mercari or any other websites, those are going to dump money in. So that's pretty easy to see incoming money. Yeah. Um, what if I, I would also really recommend you get a separate PayPal account. So if you want to do any digital transactions or even get a second Venmo account, like make sure you're doing things that are completely separate. Cause one of my shortcomings is I have banks all over the place. I just, I'm a sucker for signing up for banks for whatever reason. I like playing with software. And inevitably I go to, you know, pull my credit card out and I either don't have it with me or I grab the wrong one and I swipe my personal one when it should have been business. And yeah. it's not the end of the world. I can actually go reverse it and pay myself out of the, you know, reimburse myself out of the business. It's just, it, it causes an accounting nightmare. So as simple as you can get this, do it. One, one quick note, actually, did you, um, have you seen the PayPal? You can actually set it up to do daily sweeps. Yeah. And, and to, to just kind of, echo what you just said um separate paypal venmo accounts is it'll save you a fortune in both time and then professional fees um the biggest bane of of my existence in this professional world um is paypal simply because all of you guys you'll you'll commingle funds which means it's it's personal and business and it's really difficult to track and so I print out a, a 30 or 40 page PayPal report. I'm like, okay, tell me what all these are. Cause I don't know. And, uh, and so if you can just say, Hey, these are all my business transactions and here's the full PayPal account. That's that'll save you a fortune. Yeah. So biz over here, personal over here, keep a giant wall between the two and don't cross over. All right. Yeah. So that'll, that'll be our little, uh, that'll be our little visual since I'm a, a terrible artist. Um, real quick, back on the bank discussion, do we have this discussion? I know we talk about monetary policy from time to time. You know what the bank's ratio is? Do we do we have this discussion? Like they're what they have to keep on uh, in reserve? Yeah, yeah and that uh, it's just changed recently, but it's uh, it's kind of scary. Yeah, so I, I won't get into it. It can get political, but the uh, so banks are supposed to keep ten percent after a certain amount um, of your money on uh, what do they call it? Reserve. It's supposed to be kept in reserves. So if you if you deposit a thousand dollars, they're supposed to keep a hundred bucks on hand just in case you want some money back out. It's a it's a safety mechanism. Just like when you buy a house, you're supposed to put some money down to show that you're invested in the house and you're not going anywhere. And they can loan out ninety percent of your money to you know to make more money on your money and pay you 0.003 percent interest. Um, I was looking it up. The banks now with the COVID provisions, I guess it got passed in the PPP bills the first time around. They, uh, there's now a 0% reserve requirement. So the banks can now loan all of your money out. So that's uh, that's very interesting. So I didn't see that one published a lot. I don't know how you feel about monetary policy, but uh, that's that's not a 
not a good thing if you're looking at the the, the luck or the future of yeah. banking. All right, so ideally you have everything set up that it comes back into this bank account. So all your ins are getting tracked yeah. to this account. Um, and on the PayPal thing, um, how do you do a separate PayPal? You just need a separate email address and then connect it to this bank account. So you could just get, I mean, get a free Gmail and, you know, Caleb's fine used books at gmail.com or whatever. So just make another Gmail um, or Yahoo or whatever you're using. I don't know what all the cool emails are. I'm just a Gmail guy, but get a separate email. You can set that up. One of the nice parts is a lot of accounting software. Some of it will talk to PayPal. Some of it won't. And so one of the best things I found, you can set up PayPal, just Google, I think it's called daily sweeps. And at the end of every day, whatever's in your PayPal account, they'll just sweep it back to your bank. And then when you go to pay somebody, it'll actually come out of your bank. That way it's a, it's a good vehicle. You're not paying the credit card fees all the time necessarily. And then you still have a record of everything going on without having to go pull your bank account and your PayPal account. So that's a, that's kind of a pro tip there. All right, so if I'm gonna go spend money, how should I do it? So that's all the ins up here. Now the other part is tracking the outs. And so you can do a debit card. Yep, credit card. You can do a credit card, which the same yeah. grace for us on the business accounts with Aslo is we had separate credit cards for all of them and those are all still good. And so the nice part is I don't have to go back in and change my drip email account and my Slack uh, professional plan and all of the software that we're paying for to run our own software How's that for Meta? I don't have to swap all those out on a bank level. I simply move where the credit card is getting paid from and open a separate account. So mm -hmm. one of the nice part with having a credit card, at least from a reputable company, not a fly by night one, then that uh, that can help you out as well. So debit, credit, uh, what if I end up using cash? Yeah, this cash is fine, right? It, again, it's all about the data and, and so track it. Uh, and, uh, and if, if that's in the tracking spreadsheet, if it's in your own Excel spreadsheet, that's fine. Just don't lose out on these deductions, right? This is saving you money to spend the five minutes it takes to just keep track of where your cash goes. Exactly. So as cash goes out, if you're going to do cash, at least log it and have some sort of a record and then have a system where you, you know, you put the money you didn't use back into the account and make sure you're logging that somewhere. There won't necessarily be the record on the account. I mean, there will, if you pull 50 bucks out for garage sales and spend 20 and then put 30 back in, you'll have a record that you're down 20 and you can actually log that as you know inventory expense or whatever. Yeah. So make, make sure you do that. Ideally use a credit or debit card. I know some of you are opposed to credit cards, but you get nice perks and bonuses and you know don't carry a balance, pay it off every month. Yeah. Um, all right, so if we design this perfectly architected system where all of our ins are coming into a central account, all of our outs are coming out of that central account, it should be relatively straightforward. So what if I accidentally swipe my personal card for uh, a pile of boxes at Home Depot? It What's happens the right way all to the do time. This? So, so it happens all the time. Just fix it, right? So if it's a, if it's a, personal, ex or a, a personal expense in the business account, you can put money back in or otherwise allocate it so that it is Hey, I went and got Chick-fil-A by myself and, uh, and, and it was just a meal for me. So just mark that somewhere. If, if you bought a business item in your personal account, pay yourself back, right? So if, uh, if, if it was 15 bucks on, on boxes and you swiped your personal card instead, that's fine. Either make a transfer and note it or cut yourself a check um, or somehow facilitate that so you can put your personal money back into your personal account and we get to track the business expense. Yep. I was going to try and figure out if I could make this smaller, but it's not gonna work. All right, so yeah. I've got all my bank stuff over on the side. I was gonna try and uh, shrink that down. Apparently, I don't know how to use this tool, but anyway. Um, all right, so I have all my bank business stuff over here. That's cool, but let's say I'm starting to make money, right? And now I decide, hey, I wanna start paying myself and actually take some of this business money. And how do I cross this over What's the right way to do it? Can I just pull it out and move it to a personal bank account? Yes, absolutely. Just delineate where it's going and what it is, right? So one, one in that we didn't talk about, Caleb, was the initial seed money that you need to start a business, right? So this is kind of, it's phrased your capital contribution, right? So I've got to put some money in there. Right? Sure. That's my personal money that I put into the business. Now, in a year or two when the business is actually running and, and starting to make money, 
you can take that seed money out tax-free because you put after-tax money in there to begin with. So you can pull that money out. It's a simple transfer or a check, however you want to take it out, just note it, right? So it's a, a return of a capital contribution. Um, if you're making profit and you actually want to use some of your profit and pay yourself, same methods apply. Write yourself a check, make yourself a transfer, call it an owner draw. Um, just somehow delineate that for what it is it doesn't change the tax impact of the big picture, but it gets the money into your personal account where then you can use it for personal expenses. Exactly, and that's that's really the goal. I mean, none of us are just running a business for, I mean, some of it is a hobby and it is fun to go find books and flip them, but at the end of the day, we're trying to put money back into our personal accounts that we can spend on food and groceries and housing and vacations and golf and whatever whatever you know gets you excited. So. I guess, and it doesn't matter. So at, at, there's no games you play at the end of the year. The the IRS, right, views an LLC as the same thing as me. It's a yeah. flow through business. So whether I take the money out of the business account by December 31st or whether it stays there, it doesn't change the tax that's owed, right? So the nope. tax equation is literally just what did I make? What did I sell? What can I deduct? What are the expenses, fees, uh, everything else that we'll get into on video number two? And then what's my taxable income? And it doesn't matter if you have cash to show that. We're not really going to get into the whole dual entry or double double accounting entries. Um, we're not going to get into the accounting equation of assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. We would have to get into a uh, about 10 different sessions to get into all of that. Um, so we're going to keep it simple. All right. So what have we learned so far? You're responsible to pay tax if you're if you're running a business and, and no companies are taking that money out. So you are responsible for taxes. That tax rate is going to vary. You should do your homework, figure out what you expect to make in net income. And then you can kind of back, you know, figure that out based on what state you live in, what your federal tax bracket is going to be. And the big one that a lot of people forget about is that 15.3% payroll tax. So have a rough idea if you don't really know anything or you don't really know what your numbers are going to be. A good safe number is a third. So actually, as you're pulling money to your personal bank account, a really good habit to get into is as you withdraw money, set aside a third of it for the tax man. Yeah. Now, if your business is growing, you're continually investing in, in more labor, in a bigger warehouse, then you might have very little you know, taxable income at the end of the year, and that's okay. Um, you have to make decisions as a business owner in thinking two things. One is what's the cash situation? I have to have cash to make some of these moves. You could throw it on credit, but it's going to catch up with you. So make sure you have cash on hand. And the second part is make sure that you're planning for the tax implications of what you are doing. So um, that's a good one. So as you withdraw money, a really good habit, and I'll do some videos separately on Ally. They've got a really unique envelope system that I'm, uh, I, I'm really intrigued by. Um, and so you can actually, every time money comes in, you can say, I want 15% to be set aside for charitable contributions. I want 10% to be set aside for my retirement funds. I want 30% to be set aside for tax. And every time money comes in the top of that funnel, it'll actually get split into those buckets exactly wow. like that. So it's wow. really powerful. Now, Ally does not allow business accounts. Ally, come on guys and gals, let's get with it. So don't, don't write LLC. I, I had an LLC thing written on there and they called me and said, we don't allow business accounts. I said, uh, okay, you have to take LLC off your, your account name. Okay, fine. So be cautious with them. I would recommend only personal because that's probably what their approval's for. Um, but it's a really cool bucketing system. I'll, I'll do some separate videos on that. Right. Let's talk through just a couple of software. Uh, Diane says Dave Ramsey fans love Ally for that reason. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about some software you can use to track everything. So hopefully, guys, this, this gives you a, a nice visual picture, right? So if nothing else, if you're like, hey, I don't know for sure if I'm going to actually run a business as a business, I don't really want to go through the hoops of getting an LLC, getting an EIN, um, you know, doing all of these things. Bottom line, just get a separate checking account, open up a brand new one, throw some seed money in there enough to get started, allocate it as seed money, and then hook everything else up to that bank account. So anywhere you're going to sell, whether it's Facebook Marketplace, PayPal, eBay, Amazon, wherever you're selling, hook all those up, let them dump that money into the bank account. Don't let them go elsewhere because it's a nightmare to track. And then everything you're going to spend to have a separate credit or debit card that is tied to that and, and make just, you know, I've got a yellow card that's my personal one and I've got a black one that's used for, you know, my business and the blue one is, is Scout IQ. So just make sure you have a color system and when you're out with your buddies, make sure you pull the appropriate card. 
So that's that's you know that's somewhat simplified. Let's talk real quick. What are some softwares to track? So we mentioned the tracking spreadsheet. Shameless plug for what I'm doing. Um, so that's a tool you can use. That's not quite automated. Spreadsheets are not the easiest in the world, um, but you can pull reports from Amazon. There's a whole ton of training. Thebookflipper.com/track and thebookflipper.com/videos. You can actually go in and see pretty much every tab of that sheet. So that's really a full blown accounting system. It's kind of a poor man's version because it's not going to link up to everything automatically. You have to do a little bit of manual work, but it's a one time fee, no monthly payments, and you can buy it now and not have to deal with it. Um, I, I'll give a couple other ones. So there's two other ones I like. One is mint.com. And I use this primarily for my personal expenses, but you can also do it for business. And it will actually kind of sit on top of your bank account and it will pull all the transactions in and it's it uses machine learning they probably call it artificial intelligence but it's not that intelligent it's going to look at your expenses and try and guess what categories and you can teach it anytime you see you know amzn coming in well that's amazon sales getting deposited in my bank account anytime you see home depot well that's going to be supplies so you can actually have it auto categorize everything for you and then it'll kind of give you a nice pretty breakdown if you want a true accounting system and this one's free uh, they do have some upsells and some payroll, but I use, it's called waveapps.com or get wave. So waveapps.com, if you're nerdy, it's a dual entry accounting, but you can actually set up, you can, you can set up your seed account. You can set up all of your um, expense accounts and it'll again, will will sit on top and pull everything in from your bank. And it actually generates beautiful profit and loss statements. Uh, it'll do um, balance sheets for you as well. And at the end of the year, I pretty much just say, hey, give me 2020, you know, P&L uh, income statement, essentially. And I kick that over to Chris and he's able to just start working from there. So that's a really good option. Chris, what else do you recommend uh, that you've seen people use? There's there's a few that are out there. Um, QuickBooks has just a huge corner in the market. And so that's a, that's a common one with a lot of software plugins and, and interfacing that works well. Um, GoDaddy Bookkeeping is uh, is another um and then we've got a lot of people that just live and die by uh by the bank statements and uh and and so 12 months worth of bank statements and we're, we're categorizing everything on just an excel spreadsheet it depends on the size of of kind of or the number of transactions the size of your business and uh and and how complex that's going to be yep cool all right well I know we started a little bit late. We're going to take some time. And if you all have questions, we'll kind of open it up. I do want to give a shameless plug. I brought Chris on. We're, we're not paying him the big bucks for his time. We probably should be. Um, but I do want to say, what's what's the best website to find you, Chris, and your team? Yeah, so uh, FidelisTaxAndAccounting.com uh, is uh, is the website. And we you can... can uh, FidelisTax.com, right? Does that redirect? Uh, oh, it might, actually. Fidelis.tax might redirect. Um, I'll have to set that up. But... Uh, yeah, nobody told me I should have a short donate domain name until yeah, Matt, Matthew's gonna be all over that one. Yeah, thanks. All right, so yeah. Fidelis, where did the name Fidelis come from? So Fidelis is Latin for faith faithful. And yeah. uh and so that's where that came from. Beautiful. All right, so Fidelis Tax and Accounting dot com. Is there like a little link you can contact you or set up a yeah. an intro call or whatnot? Yeah, you can you can actually access my schedule. Um you can send us uh, an email and we'll get back to you. Give us a call. It's all it's all there. We're happy to uh, to talk with everybody. Perfect. And do you want to give a just a rough? So I know you offer a couple of different plans, and it, it just depends on the size and scale and complexity of businesses. But if I just want you to do my taxes, can you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with clients in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the transactional relationship is kind of how we we define that one. It's uh, I'll see you next year. Uh, do my taxes. Here's a here's a fee for service, and we all go our separate ways. Um, sort of the next step up in the progression and growth of your business is much more of a an ongoing relationship. And so that's the it's a fixed fee on a monthly basis. It's just a retainer model, but it covers everything. So, Caleb, we talk all the time and I never bill you by, for our time. Right. It, it's just built into that that fixed fee on a monthly basis. He you, you feel open. We can you're never worried about being billed for a minute. And uh, and so that's what we try to do to convey a lot of value to uh, to a lot of our clients. Beautiful. And you've got a team, you've got a team of bookkeepers and payroll experts and, you know, it's not just limited to you. So you, we've talked about it. You, you have theoretically unlimited scalability. 
Yeah, we uh, we have a staff of 13 right now. We're going into uh, tax season, so we'll ramp up a little bit more there. But uh, but yeah, we have a, a bunch of bookkeepers, uh, accounting professionals, CPAs, and then uh, tax professionals as well. Beautiful. And a little birdie told me you actually purchased another accounting firm. Yeah. Yes. So we were uh, we were blessed with the opportunity to uh, to acquire another accounting firm in November, and, uh, and so that that doubled our size on top of doubling organically last year. So it's uh, it's going to be a busy tax season. That's fantastic. So guys, give Chris a call. And something something that's very true: a good lawyer and a good CPA or accountant will actually save you money. Um, so certainly, if you are just getting started, the you know the accounting equation is not terribly difficult. Let me get my computer plugged back in before it decides to boot me out. Um, but a good a good accountant will actually save you money. And so when your business does reach a point where the complexity is getting up there and there's uh, opportunities to um, tinker with some of the deductions and the strategies, by all means, you want to go and invest. And, and you know, for my money, Chris has been I've, I've really enjoyed having you there just as an ally and a resource uh, when either things are tough or when things are really good. And we're trying to figure out how to uh, save a little bit in taxes. So. Um, I, I speak very highly of you and you've been very uh, integrated into the book community coming to some of the turn the page events as well. So thank you for that attention that you've given us. And guys, if you need help just with taxes individually, reach out to Chris. I'm sure if they just have a few questions, they could probably pay you a consulting fee one off. Um, or if they're really ramping up, that's that's really where Chris is going to shine and show you a lot of value. So at this point, if you all have questions, we'll stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes and, uh, and answer some questions that you may have. So if you want some free help at this point, ask away, we'll, we'll dive in. This was part one. Again, the goal is to help remove some of the fuzziness as it relates to accounting and just understand what are your obligations, when you should be paying it. And then hopefully we designed a little bit of a simple system, just separate bank account, tracking your ins, tracking your outs, and keeping that completely separate so that tax time is a heck of a lot easier. So hopefully that simple system will make things better for you, make you a little bit less worried and concerned as you decide to either keep kicking the tires or ramp this thing up. So if you have questions, drop those in either on Facebook or on YouTube. Thank you guys and gals for bearing with us. I know we started a bit late and I do apologize for that. I will not reboot my computer before part two. So uh, Coco says, my wife is part owner of the business. We pay her $1,000 a month for the work that she does. How do we account for this? So essentially you're setting your wife up as an independent contractor or an employee. So is that a qualified business expense? Like can Coco save the tax and his wife has to pay the tax? What's the, what's the short answer on that one? Yeah, so part owner of the business means that they're taking distributions more so than anything else. Um, so depending on how the business is structured, she'll either report that income on a K-1 or it gets reported as just as net profit on your personal tax return. Um, but there's ownership there, and so that that net profit is, is partly hers. Perfect. So bottom line, if she's an owner, then it doesn't really matter. It's just it's an owner draw every time you take that money back out. Uh, if you do hire someone that's not an owner, we'll get into some of that on the deductions and the employees pieces as well. Diane says, doing the quarterly estimated tax payment, it's a whole lot easier to do than doing my full tax return, correct? Um, yeah. It's not so, a 50 page document to do the quarterly. Yeah, quarterly is easy. Just log in and the IRS will take your money. Um, and uh, <laughs> and so the math the math comes into play with just setting aside a third of, or, or putting in a percentage of whatever that net profit is for that quarter. Um, so it's it's really simple. It'll take you two minutes to to pay the IRS. Yep, and just make sure you're setting that money aside. Again, a good habit. Every time money comes in, set roughly a third of it aside um, because it's going to have to go back out in the form of taxes. So make sure you're planning ahead. Uh, Christian says, "Didn't know I had to pay quarterly." Yikes! Now you don't have to pay quarterly unless you're making a certain amount. Is that correct? Yeah. So the rule is that you have to pay in a hundred percent of the prior year tax that you paid or 90% of the current year tax due. And if it's less than a thousand dollars difference, then there's no penalties or anything else. Um, so, so there's ways to avoid those those penalties, um, even if you're not making an estimated payment. Yeah, so that actually pops in. Chase just asked the same question. Is there a penalty for underestimating? There, there's a bit of a safe harbor, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So uh, let's say last year was a tight year. This year's a great year. Um, and uh, and so I owed five thousand dollars last year in taxes, but I'm going to owe fifty thousand dollars, and I know that um, in taxes for for 2020. Um, all I have to do is pay in five thousand dollars in taxes, 
because that was my 2019 tax bill and I'm safe harbored. Um, I, I, I don't have to worry about an underpayment of estimated taxes at that so point. So you don't have any penalties if you do mm -hmm. that, right? Do you have to pay any interest on the amount due? Yeah, you'll you'll get gigged a little bit on the on the interest, but again, that's it's it's three, four, five percent depending on the quarter. Um, so it's it's a nominal amount when uh, when we're talking ultimate numbers. Yeah, perfect. So again, a couple safe harbors. One, if you end up uh, paying within a thousand dollars of the total amount due, you're you're safe. And then if you pay the full amount that you paid in the previous year let's say you ramp up very, very quickly, then you're safe as well. And again, if you're having quarterly discussions or, or more often than that with a, a tax advisor, you're going to be at least planning ahead for that. We'll get into it in part three, but uh, when you start putting yourself on payroll, if you run an S Corp, it gets you some pretty cool uh, benefits there. I, I actually sneak all of my estimated taxes into payroll. So I just yeah. overpay myself in terms of salary but uh, you know, probably two thirds of that amount that I'm getting paid or three quarters of it even is just going straight to the government in the form of estimated taxes. So there's, yeah. there's a number of ways that you can get creative and a good tax person will help you with that as well. Um, KM says, which form should I fill out for small business, an LLC or S Corp? Uh, I'm on SSI. So an S Corporation is a level of complexity um, that costs money, right? So anytime you scale up and you're doing things that are more complicated, it's going to cost you money and administrative fees and everything else. With my clients, I don't advise we move to an S election or an S corporation until they're netting, right? So they're keeping at the end of the year between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars. Anything prior to that, you're going to save money in administrative costs, and uh, and there's not really a ton of tax savings. Uh, so stick with the LLC or, or just a sole proprietorship. Perfect. And we'll we'll get into some of the math on why eighty to hundred k matters uh, in part three. Uh, Jason from Texas, Austin says, thanks for the knowledge guys. Jason, I love your, your armadillo logo. I was wearing your shirt yesterday. We should trade again real soon. We've got some new scout IQ swag. I think I actually got some heading your way. So next time you refresh your logo, I'm just saying, just saying, get Chris wants something cool too. Right. Uh, Facebook user, that's kind of an odd name, but Facebook user anyway, says, does payroll taxes apply to contractors? No. So contractors um, are, are issued 1099s at the end of the year. So the definition of a contractor is you're just paying them money. You're not an employer. You have no obligation to withhold money like you would an employee. That being said, if you are the contractor and you're getting that money, then yes, payroll taxes absolutely apply. You're self-employed at that point sides of a uh, payroll tax there. Exactly. So, and we'll get into that in part three. We'll talk through those those stipulations. So, yeah, if you're if you're paying someone as a contractor, you don't have to withhold that, but they're responsible for the employer portion since you didn't pay it. Government wants the money, one way or the other. Jacob Porter says, "Is it all right to calculate an average cost of goods sold?" I don't keep track of what I pay for books under five bucks, but I do closely track more expensive books. I keep all my receipts. Thanks. Um, yeah, we'll probably get into this a little bit more in the next couple of sessions, but. Uh, ultimately, when we're talking about is this okay or that okay, it, usually yes. Um, the the important thing to do is just to uh, be consistent in the application of whatever rule you are applying. And uh, and so if you're going to take an average cost, great, do it and do it completely um, and consistently, and uh, and and you'll be just fine. Perfect. Uh, Diane says, "Where's my hoodie? Those are all shipping out. If you guys got a hoodie at our Black Friday sale." They're blaming COVID. That's just like a convenient excuse for everything, but they were back ordered on all the sweatshirts, even though they said they were supposed to have them. Typical excuse, but uh, I digress. Those are coming, actually those ship today. So if you have a hoodie coming to you, you know who you are, they're on their way. Uh, a couple more and then we'll let you go, Chris. The Village Idiot says, thanks for this guys. If I, if I recognize him, that's a, that's a fella from Michigan, I believe. We were hanging out at Top Golf not too long ago. So hello, if that's the right person. Again, Facebook user says, if you took a personal expense out of the business account in the previous year, should you still put the money back? So if I accidentally swiped my regular card on a business thing or vice versa, should I you know, try and go correct that mistake now or just move on? No, move on at this point, right? You're, if you're a cash basis taxpayer, it, it's just uh, account for it and it's gonna be reported on uh, on your tax return and, and accounted for there and just move on, Don't don't put it back. Perfect. And then one last question. It's just for me, actually. If I ever decide to run for president, are my tax returns going to be pub publicized? <laughs> I guess some of that remains to be seen. So. Are, 
Actually, our our tax they're not public records, right? You can't Google somebody and figure out their their tax. Uh, no, the the IRS takes that really really serious. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like medical uh, records. They're you know they're not supposed to be shared. Same thing with taxes. So again, yeah. find somebody you trust where they're not you know pushing that as well. Coco says thanks for all of this. Pecan Street Cookies, which is the other half of uh, Jason Ortiz down in Texas, says y'all deserve some cookies. And have you had these cookies, Chris? I think I think we had them at the Turn the Page event. I don't remember if you were there. No, I don't think I did. They are unbelievable. So go check out uh, it's Melissa's page on Instagram. So, all right, everybody, thanks again for bearing with us. We are right at an hour, so we are going to cut it. Chris, thanks for your time. You're, you're gracious. Okay. And uh, we appreciate you jumping on, especially as we get into tax season. So again, if you want to find Chris Fidelis, F-I-D-E-L-I-S, tax and accounting, whoo, dot com, Fidelis, tax and accounting dot com. And if you want to find me, the book flipper dot com, or you can find us on Facebook or you're watching us on YouTube or however you did. Anyway, so thanks for being here. This was part one, Accounting 101. Hopefully we made it a little easier, let you breathe a little sigh of relief as you are trying to get a handle on everything. And we will see you on February 9, 7 o'clock Eastern. We'll have links as well in the Facebook group. We will go live again, hopefully on time. And we're going to talk about deductions. So that'll be a fun one and uh, help you save some money as well. So we're going to sign out. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, guys.